All right, praise the Lord, everybody. We'll get this figured out here this morning. Isn't it great to be in the house of the Lord today? Thank you, Jesus. I want to um, welcome everybody. It's so good to see everybody. I'm glad to, that, uh, so very thankful that uh, we're able to be here. I was telling Alex on the ride over, um, you know, I, for those who don't know, I had a mountain biking experience on, on uh, Tuesday and um, came up over this knoll, and I don't do things half-heartedly, and was flying, as Tyler would know that I, when I mountain bike, I go really fast, and I came up over a knoll, got some air, and when I hit the other side, there was a patch of sand, and sand does not act like dirt, and I went flying, and so my, uh, I hit my face first into the ground, Glad I had a helmet on. My helmet is uh, officially destroyed. Um, it's, it's cracked in several places. And uh, hit my face against the ground and my, pushed my glasses back into my, into my face. If you look closely, my eyes are still black and blue on both sides. And my, the rim of my glasses ripped the skin off the top of my nose. Even Eli this morning said, Daddy, your nose looks really good today. <laughs> and so, um, 
really a lot of pain in my neck and back. And so, um, you know, I'm not uh, going to be playing uh, guitar today just to kind of give it a break a little bit. Uh, just, uh, I'm just uh, thankful that it wasn't worse. Amen. So very thankful that it wasn't worse. And uh, I will get back out again and do it again because uh, that's just who I am. And so, um, but I did break both my, uh, both my teeth. So if, I, if I'm talking and it sounds like I have a slight lisp, you know, that's why. My tongue is doing much better today, but all across the side of my tongue was, was all cut up because I bit down on my tongue. And it was all swollen, and but it feels good today. And a lot of the medicines in the, and that I'm taking right now help. So praise God. If you just see me fall out, that's why. Praise God. And so it's great to be in the house of the Lord today. We're going to continue with our lesson in Romans. And so um, chapter 1, I'm not going to go over chapter 1 because we've gone over chapter 1. But chapter 1 was about the universal guilt and the guilt uh, of the Gentiles and the first half of Chapter um, of chapter two speaks of anyone uh, anyone judges that judges the Gentiles as guilty, but refuses to acknowledge their own guilt. And so, um, second half demonstrates that the that the Jews are just as guilty as the Gentiles, and everybody's in the same boat. And so, uh, the theme principle of Romans chapter two is. Uh, God's divine judgment. And so if you're making notes this morning, the theme is the principles of, of God's divine judgment. And so if I could uh, say that there's five categories of divine judgment, and I will periodically, uh, you know, just mention, you know, number one, number two, as we go down through this. And so judge, um, Romans chapter two, verses one and two, therefore thou art... Inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou, thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest does the same thing. And so isn't it interesting that uh, most judgmental people are often the most guilty? They, you, you find people that are uh, very judgmental, they're guilty themselves. And that's what he's saying here. He's, he goes into verse 2. But, um, but we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. The Gentiles, if the Gentile is guilty of sin, so also is the man who condemns him for such sin and is himself a sinner. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Amen. And so if you condemn another man, you are judged of the same offense. And so those who, uh, um, who condemn, obsessively condemn others for sins, most oftentimes are trying to conceal the sins that are in themselves. And so uh, the, the, the Jews here were guilty of this. And so... Uh, Romans chapter 1 was, a lot of it was about the Gentiles, but now we transition and, and chapter 2 is a lot about the Jews. And we can see the mingling of the two and Paul is writing to them saying, yes, the Gentiles are guilty of these things, but you're just as guilty. And they uh, had this holier than thou kind of attitude at some points where um, they felt that because they were God's chosen people, that they were at a different level. And Paul is writing to them saying, you're just as guilty as the Gentiles, which we talked about in chapter 1. And so um, God's, and, and uh, cat uh, uh, category 1, the five categories of divine judgment, number 1 would be God's judgments are according to truth. Truth is still truth whether you believe it or not. Amen. If you're following after a false truth that doesn't make truth truth, even though you may believe that it's truth, it's still false. And so um, he, he, uh, God condemns everyone who sins, not just certain people. If you are living in sin, you will, you will pay the price for the sins that you are doing. 
And so no one can escape God's judgments. No one can escape God's judgments. Everyone is accountable to God. Turn to somebody and say, I'm accountable to God. Everyone is accountable to God. No one can escape his judgments. Uh, verse 3, and thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which uh, do such things, and do the same, that thou shalt escape the judgments of God. No one can escape these things. Amen. Or despises, verse 4, or despises the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth to repentance. Everyone must come to repentance. Everyone must come before him and ask God for forgiveness, amen, and repent. People by nature are self-justifying, and people by nature want to make excuses or want to put the blame on someone else. It was like that from the beginning, Genesis chapter 3, where uh, you know Satan comes to Eve, and, and she sins, and Adam sins, and God comes to them, and they start naming, or doing the blame game. Okay, Somebody else made me do it. The, the serpent beguiled me. And, and it's, always, it's in our nature to make excuses as to why people are doing the things that they're doing or why you're doing the things that you're doing. And so you cannot escape God's judgment. People uh, think they can escape from the judgments of God, but there's, there's only four means of escape for human judgment. Okay? This is in the natural. Offenses that will never be known. Maybe, maybe a person's never going to get caught. They're going to escape being caught, being, uh, being uh, judged. Okay, another one might be they, ex they escape beyond the bounds of jurisdiction. They get outside of the, the parameters of where they did the wrong thing. And the, and the, the, the uh, cops can't find them. Okay, or a failure to, in the legal process after the arrest. Maybe something goes wrong in the legal process where they never do uh, come to... Uh, justice, okay? The last one, they escape from prison and they hide from the officers of the law. These are in the natural, but guess what? No, none of these four options that I just uh, described here are available in the realm of divine judgment. You cannot hide from God. You cannot escape from uh, the sins that you've committed unless you come to God now. Does that make sense? And so people will run, people will hide, people will try to get away, but the truth of the reality is you cannot run from God. Amen. And so everyone must repent. Acts 17.30, if you put that up, please. Acts 17.30. And uh, the times of this ignorance God walk, uh, winked at, but now uh, condemneth all men everywhere to repent. He's saying, repent, praise God. He, he's, he's telling every person on the face of the planet, repent. Because if you don't get to that place where you come before God in repentance, God's judgments will come upon us. Amen. And uh, so, uh, verse 4, as I've already read, they despise the riches of God's goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering. There was a man named Lightfoot, he says this, uh, the blackest sin is, is not righteousness violated, but mercy despised. Praise God. And so God's goodness, we sing that song, God's goodness leads us to repentance. Aren't you th so thankful today for the goodness of God? His mercies that are new every morning, praise God. It brings us to that place where we come into revelation of, of his, his spirit, praise the Lord. And so um, his goodness that leads us to repentance and therefore should, it's not, it's not something that we can take lightly. It's not a light thing when we recognize and realize that we can come before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and fall on our faces and come to him and ask him for forgiveness. It's not a light thing. It's a very serious thing, amen, and it should be taken seriously. When, when a preacher gets up here and makes the altar call and says, come on, we need to repent, it, it's time to repent, God, if there's things in my life that's not pleasing to you, I even prayed that this morning. If there's things in my life, Lord, that aren't pleasing to you, am I outright sinning? Not that I know of. 
but I still need to come before God and say, God, if there's things in me that aren't right with you, God, I want to, I want to lift up holy hands. I want to lift up clean hands with a pure heart. Amen. And so everyone must come to that place of repentance. Praise God. God's grace has appeared to all men, as Titus 2.11 would say. His grace has appeared to all people. And his grace can be uh, rested in that, that a person rejects the works of grace. There, there can be a people that reject the God's grace that leads to repentance. Someone where you explain to them the things of the Lord, and yet they still reject that opportunity. The altar call is made, and still people feel the unction to, to come to the altar, and yet they still walk away with their sin, weighing them down. And so we have to take those things seriously. Uh, categories of divine judgment, number two would be God's judgment is based on deeds. God's judgment is based on deeds. And so God repays everyone based on his works and not uh, that person's privileges. If we would read uh, verse 6, who will render to every man according to his deeds. Who will reward, render to every man according to his deeds. To them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for the glory and honor, immortality and eternal life. <clears throat> Verse 8, but unto them that are contentious, and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath. Look what happens to those. I'm going to get ahead of myself. I'm just going to stop right there. And so, uh, verse 6, those who render to every man according to his deeds. Psalm 62, can you put that up, please? Psalm 62, 12 says, Also unto thee, O Lord, belongeth mercy, for thou renderest to every man according to his work. Okay, the next verse is Proverbs chapter 24, verse 12. If thou sayest, behold, we knew it not, doth not he that pondereth the heart consider it? And he that keepeth thy soul, doth not he know it? And shall not he render to every man according to his works? And so uh, another translation of that uh, would say this. I'm going to pull this back up here. Because I, I, uh, I, I looked it up on another translation. It says this. If you say, but we knew nothing about this, does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Doesn't he know that we don't know this? Does not he who guards thy life know it? He will not repay, will he not repay everyone according to what they have done? It's important that we uh, that we come to this knowledge of God that we do the right things, that we're not doing this with the wrong motives. Amen. Because God will judge according to the things that we have done. Amen. God judges on the basis of conduct rather more than, uh, than just mere verbiage. That's why he would say, you confess one thing with your mouth, but your heart is far from me. Amen. You, do, you say one thing, and words can be flattery, but your actions do not line up with what you're saying. And so God judges not just according on to what we say, but he uh, judges according to the conduct that we do. Amen. He, he judges on performance rather than just mere knowledge. You can have all of the knowledge in the world and still not do the right thing. Look at Solomon. It, blow, it boggles my mind how Solomon could be the wisest man that, that walked the face of the earth, but yet he failed so miserably. Amen. So you can be wise and yet still miss the target. Amen. And so a payment may either be in the form of punishment or reward. Total dependency uh, upon the actions of man does not uh, contradict justification by faith. And this uh, section does not present works as a base of salvation. He's not, what I'm saying here and what this is saying here is it's not necessarily you just do this good deed and therefore you're going to be saved. Works is not the works that you think of works when you read about works. 
Amen. And we're going to get to that. And so as we read in, in verse uh, sec, 7, to them who by patient continuance and in, in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality and eternal life. They're seeking, if I just do the good things, if I just worked, if I just, if I do this thing, I'm going to be okay. You've got the wrong attitude about it if that's what you're thinking. But unto them that are uh, contentious, to them that are, uh, get, get angry, and to them that are uh, doing it because of the wrong reason, and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath. Okay, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that does evil of the Jew first and then also of the Gentile. And so uh, I'm going to go back on this, this thing about works here. A man must not only perform works but have faith in those works. Praise God. Can you get James chapter 2 verse 18? James 2:18. Uh, yea, a man must say thou, that thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show you that my faith by my works. Many times when you translate that word works, uh, Tyler can tell me because I teach this in our Bible studies, it's not works as we think of works, but obedience. Now, if you put that in there, if a, yea, if a man say, Thou hast faith, and I have obedience. Show me thy faith without thy obedience. It's all different when you look at it in this lens. And I will show, ye, show you my faith by my obedience. You say, well, you know, Noah had to work 120 years. Yes, he did. But in order for him to do that, he had to obey the Lord. Amen? Amen. He had to obey that, the, the commandments that God gave him. It, he did a lot of work for 120 years. And because of his obedience, he was saved. And because of his obedience, he did what the Lord was asking him to do. Amen. Does that make sense to everybody this morning? If we were to harmonize the doctrine of judgments based on works in chapter 2 here with the doctrine of justification by faith, whom uh, you'll hear about next week, hopefully, on chapter 3, if you mingle these two together, we recognize that you cannot separate faith and obedience. We cannot separate them. Show me thy obedience, and I'm going to see your faith. When God speaks and you say, okay, Lord, this doesn't make any sense whatsoever, but Lord, I'm going to obey because that's what I do. And you watch God work everything out because of your obedience. Amen. And so uh, man must not only perform works, but must have obedience in faith in working those works. The only real faith is obedient faith. And works, as I said, is translated as obedience. Amen. The only, uh, this is, Bonhoeffner says this, only he who believes is obedient, and only he who is obedient believes. And as I said, faith and obedience is inseparable. Praise God. That's why it's so important that when you, when you hear someone say, hey, repent, that we repent, that's why it's so important that when you hear someone say, hey, in order for you to make it into heaven, you have to have your sins washed away. And then you scratch your head and say, well, how do I do that? And they say, well, good, good question, because we've got a, a, a tank full of water. You've got to have your sins washed away in baptism. And you say, well, that's a work. No, it's being obedient to what Scripture tells us. Amen. Charlie just felt the Holy Ghost. He's like shaking back there. Hallelujah. It's, the, it's being obedient to his word. And so if you're here today and you've never had your sins washed away, talk to us. Because we want to see you dancing around the throne of God forever with us. Amen. And so it's not a, a means of works. It's a means of obedience. You obey his word and, and you, therefore you get baptized. Amen. And so... This passage of Scripture shows importance of dealing with sin in our lives and, and also that we need to repent of the sins that we have committed. 
Amen. And so there's two classes of people. Let's read verse 7. Well, we read 7. Uh, there's two classes of people. Okay, are two life choices. Faith and obedience or unbelief and disobedience. You can choose one or the other. Faith and obedience, I'm going to obey, or you disobey. Okay, and so uh, two classes of people, men uh, identified. Uh, verse 7 says, those who are patient and well-doing, seeking glory, honor, and immortality, will be rewarded with eternal life. And then as we read in verse 8, those who are contentious or like to argue, they pursue, their, their pursuit is obedience unto unrighteousness, and they will be rewarded with the wrath of indignation or God's anger. Okay? For everybody that's under the sound of my voice, you have that choice. Just as they did in the garden. Am I going to obey and stay or am I going to disobey and, and suffer the anger of God in my life? I'd rather choose the first than the second. Praise God. And I believe that I'm talking to a bunch of people that rather choose the first than the second. Amen. Praise God. Verse 9. Tribulation and, and anguish upon every soul. Every soul uh, of man that doth evil to the Jew first and also of the Gentile. All evil do doers will receive tribulation. Let's read verse 10. But glory and honor and patience to every man that worketh good. To the Jew first and then also to the Gentile. Those who do good will re receive glory, honor, and peace. Aren't you so thankful for that today? Come on, let's strive to do right. Let's strive to be pleasing in His sight. Let's strive after the things of God. Let's strive to get in His Word every day. Let's, let's not make this just a routine where we come to church just on a Sunday or a Wednesday just because, well, people may, uh, you know, uh, text me because I'm not here today. Make this a priority in your life that every day you're getting in the Word of God, that every day you're reading, that every day you're praying, that every day you're getting connected to God somehow, that it's not just religion. This is not just religion. Amen. Yes, we call ourselves a church. And yes, we are part of the United Pentecostal Church, an organization. But this is so much more than just being a part of an organization. This is about having a connection with Almighty God. Amen. Praise God. I have to watch because I'm feeling a, 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 a little sharp pain in my back as I'm doing this. i got to slow down a little bit. Amen. Amen. Let's clap our hands unto the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Let's read verse 11. For there is no respect of persons with God. Amen. And this is a foundation that was not just here in the New Testament, but it's also something that we can find in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 17, just for the sake of time, I he can put it up on the on the screen here, uh, Deuteronomy 10, 17. But I'm going to read it in another translation for the sake of time. For the Lord our God is, a God is the God of gods, Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. Amen. Which regardeth not persons, nor taketh reward. He is no respecter of persons. Amen. And so God will judge everyone fairly without favoritism. Amen. Judges everybody. And so if you're making these five categories of divine judgments, number three would be God's judgment will be impartial. God's judgments will be impartial. Hallelujah. God will judge the Jew and the Gentile. God will judge Amy as much as he's going to judge Sister Wilson. Amen. God will judge myself just as much as Tyler. Okay. He doesn't have no respecter of persons. Praise God. And that's why it's so important that we strive to be living right. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. He will not overlook the sins of his people, but will judge them first. 
Verse 12, let's read verse 12. For as many ha as have sinned without the law shall also, also perish without the law, and as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. Amen. And so uh, let's, I saw Charlie get up and I thought it was my, my uh, Vince back there. I'm like, I need this, this next scripture. Okay, 1 Peter 4.17. 1 Peter 4.17. For a time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begins at us, what shall the end be to them that obey not the gospel? Well, that's a very good question that, that uh, is posed here in 1 Peter. You know, what's going to happen to them that obey not the gospel? And if you are into marking your Bible, I tell this, I told this to our Bible study groups. You know, if you're, if you're into marking your Bible, link that to 2 Thessalonians. Okay, 2 Thessalonians 1 through 9. He, God will, uh, he will not overlook the sins of his people. Okay, this is the answer to uh, Peter's questions of what happens to them that obey not the gospel. In flaming fire, this is 2 Thessalonians 1, 8 and 9. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. Okay, he's going to take vengeance on them that, know, that don't know God. And that obey not the gospel. Come on, this means you can believe and still find yourself in a place of judgment before God. Obey not the gospel. So if you've not been baptized and you've heard us tell you that you need baptized... I don't want to be harsh, but you're not being obedient to the word. Amen. Look at verse 9. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction? This, this, this bothers me to the core. Because not only are those that don't know God, but possibly those who do know God and aren't currently obeying God. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction? from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Amen. Can't tell you enough. This is where Matthew chapter 7 comes into play. Well, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy and didn't we do all these great things? And he's going to say, I never knew you. Depart from me, worker of iniquity. It's really important to understand these things here today. God will not overlook sin. Amen. God will not, I'm so thankful today for the mercy and grace of God that he gives us opportunity to make things right in his eyes. Amen. This is not a hopeless uh, teaching here this morning. We're all sinners. But God gives us that opportunity to fall before his face and say, God, I'm trying to live my life according to your word. Forgive me, God. God, whatever I need to do, Lord, help me, Lord, to, to live right and to be pleasing in your sight, God. Amen. i got to hurry. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, number four, um, Verse 12. Do we, we read that one already. Okay. Uh, God will judge according to a, the truth that a person had. Amen. The Gentiles who were not recipients of the law of Moses will be judged not by the law, but by general revelation. Okay, and, and please don't misunderstand how I'm, how I'm saying this or wording this this morning. Uh, this shows us that there is a law in the consciousness and the ability to know God. God put it in the heart of every person that walks on the face of the earth from the beginning of time until now. There's something inside of us called morals and called consciousness. And God, uh, God gave that to us. Amen? And so he will not judge someone for what they didn't know, but the, he's really stringent in regards to what they did know. And verse uh, 13, for not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the uh, doers of the law shall be justified. Amen. You have to be a doer, not just a hearer. Verse 14 says, those who did not have the law will be judged by the natural law, the law of consciousness. Okay, for the Gentiles, they have not the law, but do by nature the things contained in the law. 
Somewhere they know not to do bad. And somewhere they, they know the, the, the laws of consciousness tell them, hey, don't steal. Don't lie. You don't have to teach children to do those things, but some, sometime they begin to do those things. Okay? And so he says, uh, 